Bioshock is a really good game. And, uh, hang on, that's all... That's what it says here. Apologies for the brief introduction, the writer has informed me that the original glowing tribute to begin this list was more of a novella than a snappy introduction, so he's had to cut it down for the sanity of all of you and to reduce the ego of Ken Levine. I hope you all understand. In all seriousness, Bioshock often appears in best games of all time lists for a reason. The shooter under the sea revolutionized AAA storytelling and innovated gameplay in first-person RPGs with its streamlined design. Its world-building, themes, music, and dialogue are revered, and the mid-game twist is possibly the most impactful in gaming history. But you know all this. In fact, you probably know a lot about Bioshock, so I've scoured the web, combed through the wikis, and sat through so many interviews that I now see the face of Kenneth M. Levine every time I close my eyes, all so that I can say to you, I'm Ben from Triple Jump, and here are 10 things you didn't know about Bioshock. Number 10. The Wrench is a Half-Life reference. A nice, simple one to kick us off, but one that many of you may have missed. To quote the dulcet Irish tones of Atlas at the beginning of Bioshock, would you kindly grab a crowbar or something? Nailed it. You then proceed to look around and find a wrench lying on the ground. It may seem like an innocuous comment at first, but when you realise that the crowbar is the first weapon you get in Half-Life and your new shiny wrench is the same colour as the one from Half-Life, things start coming together. Ken Levine, and you'll hear that name a lot today, has said many times that Valve's Half-Life games inspired Bioshock's creation, citing its storytelling techniques as the reason that City 17 is so memorable. It's this appreciation that makes the line from Atlas and the wrench's colour clearly more than a coincidence. The wrench has become a part of Bioshock's very identity in much the same way that the crowbar did for Half-Life, a pretty effective homage if you ask me. Number 9. The game gives the twist away. Oh, me poor Moira. Ah, me wee baby Patrick. Nailed it again. <laughs> I'm so good at this. If you were paying very close attention while wandering the halls of Fort Frolic, those names may have given the game away sooner than expected. Yes, Atlas's fake family may have been a key part of the main twist, but if you spotted this poster in Sander Cohen's theatre district, then the surprise twist may have been a tad less shocking. A bit suspicious, isn't it, that the lead characters of a Sander Cohen musical should share the exact same names as our apparent guide's apparently recently deceased apparent family. This apparent- alright, that's enough of that. It's a bit too coincidental, basically, and almost like Frank Fontaine took inspiration from the musical when crafting his devious lie. You could even see the Who is Atlas poster as a subtle foreshadowing that Atlas wasn't who you thought he was. Maybe it wasn't propaganda all along. This creates both a kink in the mystery for the very observant among us and a welcome realisation for those on a return visit. Let's be honest though, no one spotted this the first time around. Admittedly, it didn't give the whole game away. You would know that Atlas isn't who he says he is, but you aren't aware of who you really are. And then they gave that away too. Number 8. The game gives the twist away again. Yep, they did it again, those rascals. We know why Jack never just hopped into a bathysphere and left for the surface, which is mainly due to Atlas's family and then avenging said family, but finally it's revealed that you're doing as you're told because you've been brainwashed. Would you kindly? And all that shtick. But what's stopping everybody else from leaving? Well, it's because Ryan had it so only himself and those within his inner circle could use the bathyspheres, a fact revealed in the Bathysphere Keys audio tape in Neptune's Bounty. Only Ryan and his inner circle will be able to use them without dispensation. This means you're either in some way related to Ryan or a close associate. For context, this is level 3 and the showdown with Ryan takes place in level 9. If you also wondered why the Vita Chamber would bring you back but not the residents of Rapture, well, it's because of the same reason as before, though this one is hinted at much later than the Bathysphere clue. A bonus point you may have missed was that Ryan's personal Vita Chamber in his office was switched off upon your meeting, showing that he could choose to turn it off and that he wasn't a slave like Jack. Ugh, this got way too poignant. Editor, can you put something silly on screen? Ah, oh, look at that. Thank you. Finally, not only does the game give away the twist again in Fort Frolic, but this time it tells you who Jack's real mother is. While it never directly says it, it can be assumed that the subtly worded audio tape in Eve Gardens alludes to Ryan having a secret son with exotic dancer Jasmine Jolene that was then sold away to Tenenbaum. 
Years later, Ken Levine confirmed this and clarified other things like why Jack triggers the security system. It's because he's only half Ryan. I'm guessing it's the… it's the… the rye… it's the rye part, maybe. Number 7. Ayn Rand inspired it all Russian-American author Ayn Rand is a huge inspiration for Bioshock. Her views on objectivism are the basis of Andrew Ryan's ideals, and they share a similar backstory with their upbringing, and Andrew Ryan is even a loose anagram of Ayn Rand. Alright, but I said it was loose. It doesn't stop there. Rand's novels The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged are referenced heavily throughout, with Frank Fontaine and his alter ego Atlas named in homage to the two books. Also, the famous phrase from Atlas Shrugged, who is John Galt, was mirrored in the Who is Atlas posters around Rapture. Also. Atlas Shrugged contains an idyllic city by the name of Gold's Gulch that was created for the world's finest to escape the grasp of a failing government. Ryan attempting to destroy Arcadia and later Rapture itself is mirrored from similar situations in the book. The bottles of Arcadia Merlot have the label Fountainhead Cabernet Sauvignon on them, and the characters from the Fountainhead are referenced as companies in Rapture such as Deep Frank and Antiques. And rest. That was a lot to take in. Let's hope the next one is more pleasant and much easier to comprehend. Number 6. Splicer models are based on World War I facial reconstruction surgeries. Well, that's unfortunate. Yes, as unpleasant as it may seem, the splices were indeed based on images of World War I facial reconstruction surgeries. An art installation by the name of Project Facade set out to blend social, medical, and military history with contemporary art to bring the untold histories of World War I servicemen treated for horrific facial injuries to a broad national and international audience. Well, that's what the website told me it was anyway. Anywho, the team behind Bioshock saw Project Facade and based their splicer designs on them. Whether you see it as crass or not for them to use real-life war injuries for the purpose of creating an intentionally unpleasant character, I'm on the fence about the whole matter myself, what you can't say is that it wasn't effective. An example of when a clear likeness was used was with the case of World War I veteran Walter Yeo and the Wader splicer, but be warned, any search on this subject will bring up images of the very early days of reconstructive surgery, and we won't be showing it here. Number 5. The way Bioshock tells its story and uses horror. Mise en scène is the. Uh, no, that's way too pretentious. Let's start again. Staging is the encompassing term used in theatre to describe the storyboarding, visual theme, cinematography, and narrative direction of a scene on stage. In the same way that a movie camera points towards where it wants you to look, staging uses its combined techniques to draw your eye to where it wants, the classic theatre spotlight being the obvious example. It's this technique that Bioshock employs to tell its story. It uses it throughout the game, but for a very literal use of the technique, we can look at the piano scene in Fort Frolic. From the moment you enter the room, you know exactly where you need to be. You have complete freedom of movement, but you still can't take your eyes from it. It's not something that you can see in real life, but it works in the realms of a narrative. It's these very techniques that make Bioshock's horror so impactful. Even though the game isn't forcing you to look at the thing that's scary, you still know it's nearby and you can't look away. There's the moment where a mother is talking to her baby and you observe what's happening by the shadow on the wall. Then, when you approach, you're attacked and see that there was no baby at all. It's masterful staging which makes the game so effective. Number 4. A secret message from a developer. It took 11 years to be revealed. Well, nine really. Still, secrets rarely take this long to be unveiled in the video game world. Back in 2018, one of the game's apparent programmers revealed this secret on a 4chan post. They said, How to do it according to the dev who put it there. In Bioshock 1, go to the second half of Hephaestus where you first encounter Ryan in person. Use Incinerate to get you down to 1 HP, then use it again on the area where the cutscene triggers and walk into it. You'll die right when the scene starts, but wind up in a Vita chamber outside the map. Turn on art captions and you'll see a developer message about Paul Hellquist not doing his job. No one has found this bug yet publicly, it's in all versions, cheers. Go through this process and you'll see this. Ah, Chris Klein, you scallywag. While it's not actually the first time the message was found, it was the first time that this way of accessing it was revealed. In 2016, a Twitter user posted this, the secondary way that you could see this secret. Number 3. It was originally about a cult deprogrammer. It's fairly common knowledge that Bioshock was originally going to be about either a secret island full of Nazis or something set in space, more along the lines of its spiritual predecessor, System Shock 2. 
What's less known is that there was a plan before this. In an interview with Shaq News back in 2007, shortly after the game's initial release, Ken Levine, hi again Ken, revealed what the first plan was after he was questioned about the Nazi island. There was another story before that about a cult deprogrammer. I don't know if you know what a cult deprogrammer is, it's someone who goes to take people out of cults to deprogram them so they no longer believe in it. It's a weird thing because they're basically kidnapping people. Weird indeed. The idea seemed like it could have been an interesting one though. It may even have been on the table when writing Bioshock Infinite. After all, Booker DeWitt goes to Columbia to bring back Elizabeth from a cult-like society. Whatever the reasoning behind the change may be, at least we got Bioshock in the end, and for that, we can be thankful. Though, I'll still not forgive you for the heart attack you gave me in the medical pavilion. Oh, Jesus! Number 2. The bonus round of fascinating facts. There's so many interesting tidbits and references in Bioshock that we couldn't fit them all within a standard list, so instead, we're going to give you a quick fire fact round. You ready? Let's go. Number one. We all know about the splicer that sings the Jesus Loves Me song, but did you know that it's an actual hymn from 1859? Plus, there's a full version of it on YouTube by a kid's Christian channel that becomes terrifying in hindsight. Number two. The Hudsucker Proxy was cited as being an inspiration for Bioshock's Art Deco style. The film is also set in 1958 on New Year's Eve, the same date that the Rapture Civil War took place. Number three. Ken Levine said the character of Frank Fontaine was inspired by Kaiser Sose from The Usual Suspect, and the Would You Kindly Wall reveal before the twist was also based on a similar moment in the film. Number four. The inspiration for the Little Sisters design came from Stanley Kubrick's version of The Shining, and there's also a location in Rapture called Torrance Hall named after the film's lead, Jack Torrance. Is it also just a coincidence that Bioshock's lead is called Jack? I think not. Number five. Did you ever notice that the vents are designed to look like sunflowers? Because I didn't. Number six. There's a Pac-Man Easter egg. Number seven. Ken Levine voices the Circus of Values. Kill your cravings at the Circus of Values. And number eight. Quark or Quark, or I've never seen Star Trek from Star Trek, is the voice of Andrew Ryan. The price of peace is at an all time low. He's much less threatening with that face. There's many more out there, but these are just some of our favorites. Number one, Bioshock's secret twist. The twist involving Jack and Ryan is not the only thing to be revealed when they meet. Jack is mostly silent. This is because the player is intended to project themselves onto the character. The idea that Jack is a programmed slave that'll do what he's told when somebody says, would you kindly, is meant to represent how we play games. Why do we do something? Because the game said so, even if it's illogical or we'd rather not do it. So the point where control is taken away from the player to kill Ryan is also the reveal that you yourself have actually been doing as you were told the whole time, not just Jack. It's also why there are very few cutscenes, with them only appearing at times when it's highlighting the player has no control, like the aforementioned scene with Ryan. And this all stems back to the technique of staging we mentioned earlier. With the narrative pushing the idea of free will and the gameplay subtly forcing you where it wants you to go, this dissonance is what puts you in the position of Jack, with his own twisting journey being just the cover for the real message. So next time you boot up Bioshock and Atlas says, <clears throat> Would you kindly grab a crowbar or something? <laughs> Still got it. Why not put down the controller and go and play something else, once and for all proving that you aren't a slave? Or you could just play it because, as I said at the start, Bioshock is a really good game. So there we have it. I do hope that you learned something new about Bioshock, and if there is something interesting you found that's missing from this list, would you kindly let me know in the comments below? <sighs> damn it. I got so far without making that joke, sorry everybody. You can follow myself and Triple Jump on Twitter here, and while you're at it, why not support the things you enjoy by having a look at our Patreon. Finally, don't forget to like the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Ben from Triple Jump, and thanks for watching.